Hello there. Welcome to the Network Freestyle. I'm Malcolm Budden. And I'm Darren Falwell. And we are the Network Freestylers. Today's episode is Freestyle 104, bringing you an introduction to Cisco SD1, otherwise known as Victella. So uh, Darren's going to lead this episode and do a bit of whiteboarding. Uh, but before we jump in, quick catch up, quick chat. How's your Sunday treating you, Darren? Yeah, not so bad, mate. Not so bad. Nice and uh, nice and quiet. Looking after the animals, the you know, pottering around the house, the usual. So uh, yeah, nice quiet Sunday. Uh, that's, that's what the background noise is. That's yeah, 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 mate. It's a farm here. Did you not know? No, it's not. At all. But uh, we've got chickens, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, the lot. So uh, yeah, it keeps us busy. And how did your football team do today or uh, yesterday? Yeah, we did all right actually this weekend for once. It's um, yeah, it feels feels good to uh, to get some points on the board and uh, try and try and keep up with the rest of the uh, the rest of the front runners in the in the Premiership. How about how about you? You missed your game today. Yeah, I miss, missed it today unfortunately, but uh, I kind of had an excuse. It was my daughter's second birthday, so uh, well, it was her second birthday on Tuesday and. Uh, Today was the birthday party, so um, yeah, I was watching some of it on BBC iPlayer in between what, 15, so? 20, streaming kids. So that's <laughs> you were, the key That's 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 impressive that uh, yeah that you that you gave up uh, going to the game anyway. My wife doesn't know about that until she watches this episode, but the chances <laughs> of her watching it are probably quite slim, so I'm probably going to be safe. You'll probably get away with it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So um, yeah. As I, as I mentioned today, um, we're going to talk about uh, Cisco SD WAN, otherwise known as Viptela. So Viptela. The last episode we were uh, went extensively into IWAN, which is basically a, a multitude of different protocols brought together to deliver Cisco's at first iteration of SD WAN. Um, and I can't remember whether it was 2018 or late 2017 that they acquired Viptela, which were uh, <clears throat> an, a, a, an existing SD1 company. I believe it was actually a spin-off by some people who used to work for Cisco. Um, and yeah, so they've, they've acquired that and that's now their strategic product. And they're in the process of integrating uh, into the fully into the, you know, the, the, uh, the hardware, uh, the ISR routers, the NCS boxes, etc. Um, so yeah, that's that's really like the next generation, uh, or the current generation, or where Cisco's roadmap is going with uh, SD WAN. So you've got a bit of experience in doing proof of concept design yeah. and deployment. So <clears throat> you're going to take us through the different components uh, and and what it looks like. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like as you say, um, done plenty of design work around this. Uh, um, the there's not that many of them still deployed in anger yet. Certainly not since Cisco um, took the product over. But um, and in the UK, um, it's it's a market that's not really developed as much yet because um, the cost uh, saving isn't really there that that you that you find with uh, SD WAN elsewhere i think um we talked about this before but um internet circuits aren't that much cheaper than mpls circuits in the uk so um there isn't as much of a cost driver um but certainly we're seeing we're seeing um some of the the more interesting features the um the segmentation features the security and and that kind of stuff becomes more uh, more interesting more compelling for for customers so we are seeing a lot of interest and we are doing a lot of design work around it so hopefully this will kind of reflect that um let's see how we go hey so the um we've kind of split things up similarly to how we did um the, the last show we're going to pop through the the different uh, SD WAN components, um, and then we'll look into how the um, the Viptela slash Cisco SD WAN. I'll use the two terms um, uh, interchangeably because you know sometimes you call it Viptela, sometimes you don't. So uh, bear with me on that one. But the fact yeah, I mean, that, way that that's fine because when we touched on the last show when we started looking at the documentation for IWAN yeah. versus Viptela. Uh, if you go to the Cisco Validated Design section for Viptela, all of the documentation is SD-WAN design. Yeah. 
you know, it doesn't say Vitella design, it says SD. That's, that's it. I mean, Cisco have decided to use SD WAN as the product name, which is a little bit cheeky, really, I suppose, given that that SD WAN is the um, is the, the umbrella term that that Onug and and various others have, have come up with. But um, yeah, we'll we'll call it Viptela, We'll call it SD WAN. We mean the same thing in this case. So uh, we'll see how we go. So uh, yes, yeah, so we'll step through the, the way that the fabric operates. Um, we'll look at um, how it is resilient and where the scaling uh, comes in it. There's um, a whole automation play, obviously, um, kind of the point of, of, of certainly some of the, the SD-WAN stuff um, and the way the templating works. There's this central policy that all, is all wrapped up around this to allow us to do all the, the cool stuff um, that the SD WAN is there for, so we can have a look at that. And then the last section, we'll just bob through some of the some of the considerations that have cropped up while we've been doing the design work, um, and you know, just give you a few pointers really as to to what what areas to look at and consider uh, as you go. So yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so well, that's I think you're going to go with a pure whiteboarding approach, then, Darren, <laughs> rather than putting a uh, uh, here's one I prepared earlier diagram and and absolutely butcher it like I done. But uh, uh, let's let's see, shall we? Let's um, <laughs> see how it works. But um, yeah, I'll uh, pen in hand and let's uh, let's just take it from there. See where it where it takes us. Um, so um, the way that that um, Viptela uh, originally structured the product and the way Cisco run it. Um, it's very much a um, distributed um, control in the sense that there isn't one big single controller for the environment. There's no one big single uh, element to to uh, to the platform. So the, what they've done is they've tiered the um, structure of the of the different components, and I'll, I'll kind of just just scroll these down here for you. So um, the the first element um, is the forwarding plane. Um, that's obviously all about, um, and there we go straight away. That's uh, fun and games. Okay, that's that's all about the packet delivery. So that's the the, the switching and the um, between interfaces and the routing across the network. So that's where um, uh, that plane looks after. Um, and the um, the forwarding is done by a um, effectively a CPE, a router. And I'm going to draw it like this, and I'm probably going to get bored of drawing it like this because it's quite um, quite extreme. But um, this, and this is the V what? edge, okay? Now, so that's a uh, router at the remote site. This is your router at your whichever site. Um, yeah, yeah. called the V edge, and you can yeah you can just compare that with a router really. That's the the, the same kind of performs the same function. It sits there. It takes user traffic from the LAN at that site and then delivers it into and across the WAN to another location. So, yeah, absolutely, that's what it's there for. Now, obviously, um, in um, in IWAN, you have your your master controllers and your um, your hub master controllers and so on spread through the network, and those guys are doing um, looking after the forwarding tables. They're looking after um, the routing through the network. The so the, and, and basically providing the control plane. Now the control plane sits on top of the forwarding plane, and that's our routing. Um, in the um, the SD WAN product, that uh, control plane is um, I'm going to draw it like this. It's um, the V Smart. Um, the V Smart being um, a central control uh, control plane for the for the whole environment. So um, it will understand all of the routing required to get through the network it will know all about where all those sites are about what networks are available there which virtual uh, private networks are, are um, distributed through the network and so on it's 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 the point that that um, educates the v edge as to how it does its it's to do its forwarding so if you like um if you've um if you think of it as a 
a distributed um, router, you might have a, um, a like an NPE or a supervisor module or whatever. This vSmart is the thing that looks after that. Um, it also from you could you could look at it a different way and say, well, it's actually a bit more like a uh, a BGP root reflector. Um, the 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 vEdge as a router um, knows about its local environment and to find out more about the wider environment, it talks to a vSmart and that vSmart learns from all of the other vEdges what the state of the wider network is. And so um, you've got a couple of different ways of looking at it, but that's essentially the the function it's performing. So is this a physical appliance or a VM or? A, mo a module on a router or it's a, what, it's what a good it? question they, they can be um they can all be either physical or virtual so all of these boxes can be um can be virtual in that they're um either in the cloud or um in a, on a local um a local site um and yeah both both v edges can be that um virtual or physical and the the uh the v smart appliance can be um, but typically, you'll find it's a VM, and it will be um, either on-prem or, or in the or served out of um, Cisco hosted out of the cloud. Okay, cool. Um, the um, then there's a layer on top of that because what you don't do is you don't interact um, as a user or as a, an admin directly with the vSmart. You go through um, a management plane. Um, that management plane is really where you do all the config. Um, and, and typically as an admin, you log into that management plane, you go through a GUI um, and you um, uh, basically make the configuration changes. That I'll draw as this. There are actual symbols for, for these things, but they're fiddly and complex to draw and take an age, so I'm not going to use those. Um, this one's called vManage, predictably enough. And that really forms, um, if you like, the um, the equivalent of the, the any sort of GUI access, um, CLI access to, to the kit, um, or if you're using program uh, current programmability, you can you can you have an API to, to go out as well. So you can run scripts that make changes um, into vManage. vManage pushes those changes to vSmart, which deploys the, um, uh, the the policy and the configuration directive to the vEdges. Um, I'll draw in a little bit more around that in a second. Now there is one other element to um, to the platform. Um, and it's referred to as, as an orchestration layer. Um, I'm a little bit like, mm, orchestration's a, an odd word for it, but, but essentially what it's there to do is to look after um, the inventory um, and the provisioning of the environment. And it's called um, vBond, which is, again, a, a slightly odd name, but um, it's there. Basically, every device that joins the network registers with vBond. vBond uh, knows uh, about IP addressing. It knows what licensing you've got. Um, it's got information, inventory information from Cisco with serial numbers that it ties all this information together and then um, allocates out um, config um, to, to, in order for you to make sure that your devices join your network. Um, a little bit complicated. Um, we'll, we'll come to a bit more about how that works um, in a bit, but just be be aware it's there and and be aware that it forms a pretty key part of the uh, of the um, the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. So one, uh, just on that, then one of the questions mm -hmm. I'm not familiar really with Viptel other than like, yeah. some marketing slides and stuff. So are all these components that you're talking about are they compulsory parts of the solution? Or are they yeah. like, because you know, obviously with other products you can say, well, I don't really, need, I don't use the management layer or I don't want to pay lots of extra money for bells and whistles. So are all of these components part of the solution that are required in order to deliver uh, an S, a Cisco SD1? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the V bond, for example, right? So the V bond, um, you will typically have that. Um, 
both both a, a global V bond, which is which is a Cisco hosted um, V bond, but you will also have a corporate one that looks after your own network. Um, there'll be a V manage because you have to have a management point for the environment, um, and it provides that single central point. And the V smarts are the things that actually um, look after the forwarding. So again, you have to have those there. And then, of course, you need a router uh, or a CP of some sort. Um, so, so that's where the edge comes in. So, yeah, all of those different components uh, are required to be part of the solution, um, and they all have a, a sort of key uh, key role, mm -hmm. really. So, uh, yeah, you can't are there are any of them combined? So, do you run the V bond and the V manage on the same box, for example, or the you V would... manage and the V S or the V smart on the V same box, or are they? As, I mean, they're separate VMs um, typically, so so there's nothing um, stopping you running them on the same host, um, but but they'll still operate as individual machines, so virtual appliances. So you could run them, like you said before, you could run them on ENCSs or you, uh, as a as a dedicated appliance to run them, or you can run them in your VMware um, uh, environment if you've got an on-prem VMware. Or you can run them in AWS or Azure uh, in the cloud, so long as you've got access to them in the right way. And, and again, we'll we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, all of these things have to talk to each other, right? I mean, that bit's fairly fairly obvious. Um, the in particular, um, the V edges um, have to be able to see a v, the V bond first thing they do. Um, the V bond will talk to the the V manage and the V um smarts as well v manage needs to be able to push config to to the v smarts and the v smarts need to share state with the um with the v edges so there's a there's a real mesh of um connections between all those devices now these are all um either well these are these form up as dtls connections okay so that's that's um tls over udp by default or you can use TLS so that's over over um, TCP, um, and amongst amongst other protocols that are running across here, um, you've got uh, NetConf, which is obviously doing all the configuration work. So as you make a change in vManage, it pushes an, um, NetConf um, messages through the system down to the v smarts the v smarts down then into the v edges the v edges have a cli you can log into them as as individual devices but you typically don't because the whole point here is you've got that central point of management right so so netconf is used to deal with all that you've got snmp running in here okay so a lot of the um uh What's the word we want to look for? The telemetry, I suppose, um, is is done using SNMP, but you've also got um, IP fix to uh, to get sort of flow information through there as well. well um, fact, the um, open standard uh, NetFlow, basically. Netflow, basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, so between those two things, that's where your telemetry and your your, uh, your visibility comes from um, in the management and monitoring platform. That's where where you'll see those. And, uh, on the SNMP, is it is it, uh, is it up to the um, the customer to decide whether that's version two or version three, or is there anything to force Good customer? Question. Good Sorry, question. Um, no, no, no. You can, you can these things like they force you. you yeah, no, you can do two or three, and you can push. The, the, obviously, the idea here is that you can take information up and out of the platform and deliver it into other monitoring systems, so that you've got, you may have monitoring systems already doing other things, so you can pull that information out into that. So, um, yeah. it'll you can do two or three from there. Um, yeah. The other, the other um, main protocol, probably the most important one um, in the in the system, is called OMP. Now, OMP um, or Overlay Management Protocol um, is the means by which the vManage, um, uh, no, well, it's, it's more the vSmarts really, and um, uh, control and um, uh, update the, the, the routing throughout the network. Um, it's about um, 
basically the the v edge is telling the v smarts right these are the um the routes that i require across the network these are the different types of routes that are happening across there and again we'll come to that a bit later um and um the v smarts it's, it's basically a, a modified version of of uh, mp uh, bgp mm. so this is where that sort of root reflector type behavior of the v smart comes in because essentially in this case that's that's kind of what it's doing here um you're you're receiving the roots um of a specific type and then you're um, forwarding them through to other um v edges compared with root reflector clients but but essentially you're doing something very similar mm -hmm. So those are the elements. That's pretty much how it hangs together. There's one more key part to this that that I've not mentioned. Um, that um, I've already said the communication between all these these is over DTLS or TLS. Uh, in order for that to work, they're in, that's encrypted, of course, and the encryption needs um, PKI. So, <clears throat> um, and and without an, a, 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 a appropriate PKI infrastructure, this won't work at all. Now, there are ways and means. Um, you don't need to build your own um, full-blown PKI if you don't want to. vManage can can be, um, can look after all the certificates for the environment and can issue the certs automatically and so on. Um, the problem is, well, it's not so much but if you wanted to use your own certificate, your own um, organizational certificates and, and certificate authority, then it can be um, a little bit challenging to, to do this. Again, we'll come to this a little bit later. Um, but essentially, you've got a choice. You can either use a, um, uh, managed by vManage and um, using with DigiCert as the, um, the root CA, or you can use your enterprise um root ca so um we'll come to that a little later but uh these are these are all things you need to sort of consider obviously if the um the the um uh, the authority the, the ca falls over if there's an issue with it and you lose connectivity and you um your um certs expire and you can't um, update them your connectivity will die because you you can no longer see the control plane so you do need to be clear on that yeah, okay. and that's going to be a common theme with any of these types of solutions, really. Because completely, it would be interesting if we look at any, you know, maybe not in this particular series of videos, but if we we might come back to something like uh, I don't know, Silver Peak or Riverbed or something like that, and if we can find an SME yeah. uh, in the area, because it'd be interesting to compare and contrast how, like, you know, the modern day, uh, as it were, so non Iwan. Uh, uh, solutions like Silver Peak and all, Silver Peak are some of the leaders out there, uh, etc. Um, yeah. well, there's loads of SD WAN vendors now that be interested. Well, this, this is wow. it. We're, yeah. we're starting to to uh, to deal with more now. We're seeing um, Juniper come into the to the fold. Um, you know, they they're looking like a, a strong um, contender. You got Vela Cloud, of course, from VMware. Um, yeah. who are, are doing some interesting things because they're able to extend into an NSX environment. Um, you even got the smaller players, people like Fortinet um, do SD-WAN products now. And, and, you know, it depends on how much you want to pay for this stuff, I suppose. But, mm. you know, the, the, fundamentally, like you say, there are some things that are going to be there in every single one of these. And we can't can't get away from that, really. So, yeah. Um, yes, I think you're right. I think we probably it might be worth doing a, a like a, a PKI um, discussion at some point. Just just to PKI explain what it is. Vendors, if we can find the people to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, All definitely. Right. Cool. Carry so on. so that's that's the components and how it all hangs together. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is just step through um, and show you a little bit about how that uh, how these things actually interact and build up they'll build up the fabric itself okay so if you just bear with me a second and we'll, uh, start another whiteboard okay and i was going to do something fancy and clever about taking that one and and just exploding it and taking bits out but i'll just i'm going to redraw it because that's that's uh, that was just silly so um, yeah yeah always 
<laughs> always so um what uh how best to, to approach this right okay so for every we've already said for every um implementation we need that that um that the controller platform if you like um so what i'll do up here is draw up and we'll change that back to blue so I just feel that way um we've got our v bond we've got our v manage and we've got a couple of v smarts um again i'll come to the to the sort of resilience side of this um but the the v smarts you you right for for the for the platform to operate the v edges um don't can actually lose visibility of the controller platform for a period of time obviously they can't make any changes or updates but they'd still need you know they, they ideally need to see the, the the whole of the platform but if they can function without it now um typically what you'll have is you'll have one two or three v smarts in the network the v edges can register with multiple v smarts and so they can um sim same again right think of bgp root reflectors you, you can off you can have um backup um registrations and and be able to um to, to pick that, de that that information up from multiple places so um what we'll do is here is i'll just draw the two v smarts in but you could have a whole raft of them serving um a number of the edges um uh, but not necessarily all of them okay um all of that that platform is accessible through um a, and i'll just draw it like that a controller network okay now that controller network can be um in a data center it can be in multiple data centers it can be in the cloud it doesn't actually matter um where it is um, there, there are complications with with having, for example, cloud based, uh, but we'll, again, something we can we can uh, bump into later. So uh, we'll, we'll go through that. So long as these guys can see each other and see into um, where the V edges live, then we're all good. OK, so um, what we then need is obviously our transport networks. Now, this is comes this this will start to look a little bit familiar based on what um what we talked about last time in the iwan thing so we've got for example um we might have the internet um as one transport network and then we might have a private mpls as a as another um and then we have our V edges, our um, uh, routers, if you like, and they might all be connected down the bottom here. And I'm just going to draw some random boxes for a minute and we'll fill the, all the detail in. And I'm going to make those a little bit simpler than the, uh, the ones we were drawing before. Um, so you can have, for example, um, a site may have um a single connection into a single transport it may have um take one site and it may have um the v edge may have connections into two different transports you might choose to have two v edges on a site and have that configured that way where one look goes into one transport and one into the other and then this guy at the end here, he can be, he can just go into a single transport as well. So long as these guys can see from each of their interfaces, the controller platform at the top, then we're all good here. Okay. So there needs to be obviously connections between these networks um, so that the controller controllers themselves are able to present on either of those two transport networks. Um, the, and, and we'll come to this in a bit, but the V edges themselves will um, try and establish connectivity across all of their interfaces back to the controller network, uh, the controller network and to the other V edges. Um, so we need to be sure that that, that is fully visible um, in both of the transports or, or multiple transports. There's nothing stopping you then scaling this out to um, a third or a fourth or a fifth 
um, transport network if needed. Um, so can I ask a silly question, just, yeah. just for my, uh, just as an observation, right? So see the controller network. Yeah. Can you just explain a bit more about what that actually is. So is that like you know two data centers and a data center interconnect yeah. or or what? It can be the, the point. What the point is, is it can be. Like what's in could, the cloud? Just at high it level. Could, it could literally be anything at all. So so that could be, um, it could be a VPC in in AWS, or it could just be um, a VLAN hanging off the back of a router that's connected to to the MPLS here, um, with a firewall off to the side to allow it connectivity to the internet. It, it it's whatever it needs to be, if you like. Right. Um, in order to get a connection into those two transport networks. So, um, so uh, you, let me, let me, IWAN, is that like the front door VRF kind of network? Is, so, so, yeah, essentially what, what you're talking at this level is some, um, let's say, tell you what, let me just redraw it. That's, that's you know, it's a really valid point, actually. I'll redraw it and then we'll try and explain it. Um, imagine that this is, this is a single VLAN, okay, with a um, So the vSmarts just need to have connectivity between each other, yeah, is what we're saying. Yeah, essentially, they the vSmarts need to be able to see each other, okay. Um, they need to be able to see the vManage, they need to be able to see the vBond. So it really doesn't matter. They can be on the same subnet, different subnet. Cool. Right. Cool. Yeah. So completely, um, it, it doesn't matter. And then that, they need to that some, it up, I think. Yeah, yeah. needs to have some way of presenting into the um, into the two transport networks. So in this case, you can route that subnet into the private network, and so you've got visibility of everything's connected there, and you can then nap through the firewall and into the internet. And so the, again, you're presenting an IP address of a of a device that's that's um, visible over the internet. Okay, so yes, no, it's a really good point, but but oh. if you imagine that that subnet could be um could be multiple subnets it could be um in the cloud it could be <clears> in, a, in a data center or it could be just just about anywhere um so long as it's got that connectivity sure that clears it up but if you if it helps you to, to illustrate the point just uh, draw the controller cloud back yeah. in no 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 that's that's this is yeah. fine because it, it doesn't it doesn't make it uh, too much in the way of odds on this one so that's fine um as i say if you've got you know you could potentially have um uh you know 4g over here um with another site hanging off the hanging off that guy so long as he can see the controller platform through the internet access again um you know you don't need a directly connect directly connected so long as it's routable uh through the transport you're all good um Okay, let's see. So, so um, when these guys, when these VEDGE routers come up, um, what they need to be able to do is, first of all, is register with the VBOND. Um, so um, I'm going to draw this on, then I'm going to take it off again, uh, just just to prove the point. But yeah, so so let's let's pick um, pick this guy as he uh, comes up on the um, on the internet. He'll DHCP for an IP address. Uh, for he'll then um, know that he has to go to to VBond to to get into the uh, uh, to join the network because that's that's hard coded into his into his um, software, right? Um, so he goes off to the public to a public VBond. Now that is going to I'm going to draw that over at the side here. That lives off in Cisco world somewhere, right? That's a that's a, um, a public v, v, uh, vbond .viptella .com. Um and this guy basically goes away to to the to the public Viptela instance. The um, when you place an order for the Viptela software, you get given a whole load of serial numbers, obviously, as stuff comes back. Cisco re um, at that stage um, will request an IP address for your vbond. And what you do is um, they will register that centrally so that as stuff joins the network, um, they can redirect it um, to your your organizational VBond environment. So as that 
initial connection comes up, there'll be a response comes back saying, yeah, I see you. I know who you are. You need to go across into the into the other V-bond. Um, so let's get rid of that. Um, yeah, so that what, what you explained there like sounds quite similar to Meraki. So the, the fact that, you know, you, you get a serial number. I think the Meraki side of things is a bit more self-service. So rather than Cisco tying it to an IP address, you get the Meraki device not necessarily just SD WAN, but cloud based registration, if you like. Yeah. You yeah. can scan the serial number, you can input the serial number, and then when you plug it in, it gets a DHCP, talks to the Meraki cloud, and then it shows up in your portal. So is it yeah, a similar so, so, idea? It works, yeah, I suppose it works in a similar way, in the, uh, except that what you've got here is that you think about when your, um, when your routers get sent out or your V edges get sent out from Cisco, that that information about um, MAC, address, um, MAC addresses, the serial numbers and everything, is already recorded in the V-Bond. So when you've when you've placed the order for the kit, you've already mm. at that point, or, or uh, as part of the process of, of arranging the delivery, you've given them the IP address of your internal environment. Um, and you can, um, they're hard-coded with a DNS name to go to, to the V-Bond. And then when um, they get the response, it, it diverts them across then into your corporate one. So yeah, you're you're right. Similar idea, similar concept in that it's about about right. shifting. It's done via uh, DNS then, I guess if it, um, if it uh, if you get the IP address wrong or something, they just change the DNS record and it'll. Yeah, so it's all it's, it's a, all done. Yeah. All done with DNS. I mean, the, the, we'll, we'll, um, I mean, we'll come to this a little bit more in a bit more detail when we talk about automation. But there's, yeah. um, there's basically there's a, a specific um, uh, DNS name, and if you're clever, you can you can actually bypass going to Cisco and, and point it back at um, an internal one to, to speed the process. But we'll we'll cover that shortly. But essentially, yeah. what this is about is. Being able to hit that that V bond across the, the the transport network in this case, um, the internet. Now, obviously, you've got to be able to do the same thing across the private network. So, when you bring up um, a V edge in the private network, you have to be able to um, to get it to to put to point at the uh, at the V bond address that's that's seen across that private network. Um, again. You can, if you've got the the right setup with your with your service provider, you can you can um, go ahead and do the same thing, and use um, DNS. And if you've got internet breakout, then it can get break out to the internet to hit Cisco and be diverted and so on. Or you come up with a different way of doing it. You can potentially template the um, the V edges uh, and push config to them before they're connected to the network. Uh, so, so manually either sit down and, and actually console into the thing and do it that way, or you can pre-stage them, uh, whatever whatever means. The first thing that, that those guys need to do is be able to hit that V-bond. That's that's the key. So, once when you say that got, V-bond, do you mean the is it always the Cisco one on the internet? Well, it doesn't have to. You don't have to push it to that one first. Um, all that one's really doing is diverting stuff back. The, the, the appropriate um, V edge can, edges back to your corporate one. So if you're on a private network, you can force it to just go straight to your private. Um, one, the only one yeah. at the top that you've driven. Yeah, okay, yeah, I got exactly it. That. Exactly that. So once that's done, what then happens is that V bond comes back to to um, the V edge and tells it about the V smarts that it's that it's got available to it to register with for, for a from a routing perspective it will also um obviously interact with v manage so that you then um those v edges appear in the um in the list of of v edges that are available uh, to be managed right so so v manage being that user interface v smart being the controller yeah so um so i'll take those off again and and now this guy goes to v smart and it goes, oh, yeah, I'll go to that, the other vSmart as well, so that I can register with two. So if one fails, I've got the other one as a, as a backup. And then those guys, this this then forms up that DTLS connection we talked about um, in order to, um, to then start talking OMP. So this is the point where, where you've, 
you've gone through, you've got an IP address, you've registered with the VBond, VBond has told vManage about you, you've then registered with the vSmarts, and you've at that point, the vEdge has now establishes a, a controlled uh, conversation with the vSmarts, okay? And that's and that from a control point of view, obviously from from all of those um, those other V edges, that's pretty much it. What what it will do is will establish those connections over all of its transports. So, for example, in the middle um, uh, the middle there, this guy will establish a connection this way, and he'll establish a connection that way to the same V smarts. Yeah giving you the resilience so that if you lose one transport, you still got a control connection over the second transport and so on. Okay, so um, you can see that this uh, diagram is already going to end up messy, but uh, yeah, we'll uh, try not to try not to let it get that way. Um, but yeah, so so you're building up that sort of mesh of um, of control connections back to the to the vSmarts. This obviously is why you don't want to connect every vEdge to every vSmart because you'll end up with millions of control connections over the uh, um, over all of the interfaces so so you, it's sort of fairly fairly selective you want to keep it down to well they have a maximum of three v smarts per uh, per v edge okay um, so that sorts our control side out now the other bit that gets interesting from here is then how you talk between the LAN environments at each of these sites right um there's um let me draw in some fact yeah let's leave that there let me draw in a couple of couple of things here um try and make this a bit clearer so you might have uh, a LAN environment at each of these two locations here let's say this one is uh, 1.1.0.0 slash 16 and that one can be um, 2.2.0.0 slash 16. Okay. Now in um, in Viptela parlance, um, these are um, service um, lands or service networks, if you like, um, they sit. Uh, you've got you've got two sides of the uh, of the the Viptela V edges. You've got the transport side, and you've got the service side. Um, and so these these interfaces that go to the towards the LAN are called service interfaces. Um, and essentially, they're the ones where you'll interact with whatever is on site. Um, then, voice plan, data VLAN, management yeah, yeah. VLAN. All, all of those or you might find that you've got um, you might have a, a LAN switch uh, on this side with a number of VLANs and then you might run um, VRRP here for, for a default gateway um, or you uh, for static routing or you might choose to run OSPF into into the uh, into the routers, you, you've got those as options. Now there's a um, I'll, I'll come to it in a minute, but in that scenario, um, what you would do is is have these guys connected together, um, and what you can do essentially is extend the uh, the transport through uh, like so um, to the other router on the site. So you you. Physically, you only need um, two transport circuits on a site, but you're able to extend that transport into both routers. I'll come to a little bit more about how that works in a minute, but it just just shows you that if you lose um, one of the uh, one of the transports, but not one of the routers, you can still use both routers. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's it. That's something that uh, again is very, is very similar to IWAN, uh, but we never really covered it. I think we covered enough details in IWAN, but that's <laughs> uh, that's achieved in IWAN where you have a similar requirement for each of those two routers to talk yeah. to like the green and the red cloud, but yeah. instead of extending the transport like through to the other one, they run a um, it's an EIGRP sub address family over a, a, a an auto magic tunnel. So if you think <laughs> about, um, uh, 
<clears throat> yeah, so it basically creates like an EIGRP peering automatically between the two routers. Yeah. To, to, so if uh, you know internet fails, it knows to route the other way and vice versa. So sure. it's the same. Sure. Way yeah, I, 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 I should imagine probably under the hood works in a similar way. Um, yeah. Uh, that uh, we'll we'll come to that a little bit in a minute because there's there's a. Sure. There's, in terms of the way these the, the way the tunneling and the control operates are quite specific um, the, the sort of approach but we'll like I say we'll come to that so um, yeah if, if obviously uh, if you've got a, a device that's sat on 1.1 uh, the one that one network uh, on the left hand side and it wants to talk to something on the 2.2 network um, you've got the control plane stuff in in uh, in place you the V edge uh, v edge number um, number one uh, site number one um, can uh, find out that to get to to something it has to go to um, a v edge at site number two um, and the way that it that it does that and that's it's, well, we no surprise whatsoever um, it uses a tunnel so basically the um, the uh, and I've just realised I'm running out of colours. I'm going to switch to black. Um, so the the, the V edge um, at site number one here will form up um, a tunnel to every other V edge that's in the uh, that that's in the network. And on every um, interface that it's connected into that into the network. So, for example, um, you'll end up if you go in between sites one and site two, you'll actually end up with um, in this scenario a tunnel across the private network to one router, a tunnel across the private network to the other, a tunnel across the internet to one, and a tunnel across the internet to the other. So you've got um, connections of from every inter from both interfaces in site one to both interfaces on both routers in site two mm -hmm. so a, full, a full mesh of tunnels basically um and that happens across the entire environment okay so so you end up with connections to every single other interface to uh, on every that other on. are those tunnels always on rather yeah, than on so so those tunnels come up um, once once uh, a device registers and and uh, hits vSmart and, and advertises the fact that it exists. Um, it advertises the fact that it has interfaces in the network, and as soon as those interfaces come up, then tunnels form. So in a sense, what you're doing really is you're forming a full mesh of tunnels between all of the uh, the V edges in the network, um, regardless of the transport. And it forms up, and we and this we kind of alluded to this when we did the IWAN thing. It essentially forms up a single network mm -hmm. across all the whole thing. You've got the single yellow network that everything is connected to. Some things are dual attached, other things are single attached, but essentially you've got that single um, overlay network. Okay. Wow, <laughs> there's a there's a lot of lines and it's a lot of stuff, but but essentially that's that's what the, the what you're trying to achieve here, I suppose, is that you've got a single network, uh, a single overlay network that that regardless of whichever um, access method you're using, whichever transport method you're using, you're able to join the same network um, that that everything else sits in. Um, Vsmart looks after the uh, the routing across there. Vmanage then. Provides the uh, the visibility and the and the uh, control of that from a user perspective. Okay. Good. All right. Good. So that's that kind of puts you, um, uh, you shows you how the fabric is built. I suppose it's moving on to into sort of um, uh, the the next um, item from the agenda. Um, what I'll do is I just want to quickly. Um, explain how then um, traffic passes across those tunnels um, because it's relevant for doing the, the the resilience and the scale conversation. So I'm yeah. just going to go on to the next one if that's okay. Any no. questions? No, I mean I think like the concepts, uh, that stuff all seems to it seems to be uh, to me anyway because I'm learning about Victella here as well. 
uh, the, the way that, you know, the fabric is built, there's uh, a similar process to what I've seen before elsewhere. But, yeah, no. I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if it's the same for pretty much any. Um, uh, you know any of the other um, the other technologies to be honest it's um, because it's saying in a sense what is a, an SD1 other than a VPN in reality it, it is about it's, it's a having a VPN you're using the internet as transport so it's got to be encrypted um, so really it's just a big um, a big VPN that you can run over the top of multiple networks well that sounds like DMVPN to me that sounds like all of those other things that, that that it could ever be, and so, yeah, why why would it be any different? I think the the difference comes in the control and this and the simplicity, I suppose, in how that stuff is is put together, right? Yeah. So, okay, so very very hopefully quite quickly. Um, what I'll do here is I'll show you how those tunnels uh, once they're formed are used, um, which is sort of fairly fairly important, I suppose. Um. If you think of, and I'll keep, I'll, I'll simplify this ooh, hello, um, as, as much as I can. Um, so you've got vSmart, which is sat out in the in some network somewhere. I'm not going to, not worried about what connectivity it's got. And vSmart is talking to those V edges. Um, the V edges are connected to their transports, uh, like so. <clears throat> what what happens? Um, there's there's some additional information here um, when um, the V Edge actually registers with with V Smart or, or starts a conversation with V Smart. Um, what it what it actually tells V Smart about is the fact that it's um, it has a, a unique identifier. So typically, um, much like we have router IDs in routing protocols, it's a very similar uh, type of arrangement. It looks like an IP address, um, but doesn't need to be routed, routable in the network. So this one might be 100.100.100.1. That might be 200.200.200.1, let's say, or .2. Why not? Okay, so you've got like a, this, this system ID. Okay, that um, the the... VEDGE also has um, identifiers for its different interfaces. So this guy and this guy, this guy and this guy. Now they're called, um, they call these T-locks. Um, and, and so this is where we start to get into the into the nitty gritty a little bit, but it's it's useful to know this. The T-lock is basically a description of the, the um, the transport connectivity that comes out of a particular V edge. So in, in 100.100.100.1's case, it has um, an internet connection. So that's one T-lock for that and an MPLS connection. So one, one T-lock for that. And they might be called red and green because of, um, they call it a color, uh, literally. Um, the, the transport you're connecting to is called a color. Um, there are some standard default colors that they use, which are um, in some of the policy, as you define the policy, you define a policy based on the color. So for example, in um, if you've got private networking, uh, so if you've got private network, a green one in this case, you might not uh, want to use um, public address space in that in that uh, in that private network, so it would treat that slightly differently to how it would treat the the color of if the color were red and internet. Yeah, just it's just just an indication of of what the the transport method is. Okay. Now, um, so obviously the 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 V Smart knows about these devices. It knows about the these these T locks, um, and when um, one V Edge wants to um, to establish a connection to the other one, the vSmart will tell it, right, well, that vEdge that you're trying to connect to has two T-locks. One is red and one is green. And the and the one at this end said, well, well that's okay, because I've got a red and I've got a green. So if, what, he, what it will do is it will form um, a tunnel, a red tunnel and a green tunnel, right, between the two. Nice and simple. 
and that's a, a standard uh, IPsec tunnel, same as same as we're always we've always been used to, right? Um, you can you can use GRE. So if you're using a private network, for example, you can just use a GRE tunnel rather than um, an IPsec tunnel if you should so desire. Obviously, there's an MTU um, implication on that, um, but uh, you know, uh, standard um, as with any um, any SD WAN, right? That, that everything uses tunnels, so there's an MTU implication for everything we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now once those once those tunnels are established, um, what then happens is the V edges start um, talking across those tunnels um, using BFD. And they use BFD for um, to measure the quality of the, the transport uh, through that tunnel, right? So that's about checking latency, ch checking jitter, a packet loss and so on and so forth that's that's the mechanism they use to determine how good is the transport between here and here they use bfd in a slightly different way than you would typically associate it yeah is that for like um <clears throat> sorry my experience in using bfd is more for fast failure detection so is yeah it well, it's uh, well. I suppose it's kind of used for that as well, if you think about it, because because really, um, what what you've got here is the um, uh, if you think about this V edge one, in fact, let me just mm -hmm. so V edge one over here. Um, we'll see if V edge two um, is no longer accessible over the internet uh, as soon as that as soon as that BFD t um, session yeah. drops. But it's also using it to to measure the the quality of that of that uh, that transport as well. So yeah, as, as a nice side effect. You have the timers and stuff like that, can't you? You you can. I mean, I um, I that's a really good question about whether they've how far they've tuned it. Um, you know what? I'm going to follow up on that, and we can drop drop a message um, on a comment in the uh, in the show notes about that. Um, but uh, but I, I believe that you know def default timers are quite aggressive anyway. Um, but I'll have a check and see just how aggressive. Yeah. But in in, in well, our yeah. case, obviously, what what we wanted to do is establish the fact that yes, we can access that that other site over the internet, and yes, we can do it over the MPLS. And these are the parameters for those um, for those connections. Mm-hmm. So, so, so then it gets us in a position where, from when we start applying policy, we know what state we, we're dealing with when we're coming to to apply that policy. Now, there's one other element to this, I suppose. Um, you've got um, the potential to run multiple VPNs over the top of this. So you might have, for example, um, corporate traffic, so laptops. Um, or um, telephony devices, or something, which are which are trying to talk between the two sites, and they might be in v in the corporate VPN. And then you might have I don't know, you might have some IoT type devices or security. Security is a good one, where um, you've got a separate a separate security network. Um, what what these guys do um, effectively, the V edges will multiplex those VPNs uh, across the overlay network. So they'll use the same tunnel to get between the two V edges, but they uh, label the traffic as they're passing through uh, through the tunnel. So it's so it's kind of a second layer of overlay almost um, on on top of the, uh, the the tunnel mesh to make that happen. Yeah, and it's that's I mean that's a good that's it's almost uh, <clears throat> replicating MPLS L3 VPN behavior. Yeah. So rather than like uh, so if it's using the same tunnel uh, again in comparison to IWAN only because that's what we talked about before IWAN uses like multi multiple tunnels with VRF light which makes it hard to scale from yeah. I think the scaling limit was like 20 VRFs but if we're 
tag effectively tagging the different uh, networks, as it were, with, um, uh, which are equivalent to, I guess, VRFs. Yeah. Then over a single tunnel, that's quite similar to like MPLS, uh, MPLS type behaviour across a service provider core. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, I like or, that. That or or dot one Q or whatever. It, it, very similar similar approach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just an additional label that uh, that signifies. Yeah, this stuff is once it's been passed across the tunnel, decapsulate. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's going into this VPN. That's going into that. So, yeah, which is which is neat. Like you say, not having to run all the extra tunnels, not the, no more overhead from an encryption point of view and so on. It makes a whole load of sense. Yeah, I like that. We, we talk to, we'll talk about resilience and scale, but but you mentioned it's worth mentioning at this point. There's um, because you're running a, a full mesh of tunnels here, you do run into limitations on the on the CPE. Um, you, so that there is a, a requirement to, to sort of manage that, and we'll and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there is there is a need, so so we'll we'll. Um, we'll cross that bridge. The other thing is from a VPN point of view, you can have up to 512 VPNs configured on these um, on these V edges. Two of them are um, system VPNs. So one um, is for the transport and one is for management. Um, the other 510 are user defined. So they sit there as we referred to them before as service uh, VPNs. Um, the number that you can actually configure on the VEDGE is a licensable thing. So, so if you take the bottom license, you can only have one. If you take the middle license, you can have five. And then if you take the uh, the top license, you can have as many as you like. So, yes, it's it scales, but you have to, to, to sort of factor in the fact that uh, you've got license costs and everything as well there. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. It's um, it's neat, and if, and you've still got again, um, you've got a single OMP session, um, back to the vSmart to manage all of that. Yeah. So so again, you're not doing multiple control planes and and whatever to to manage the separate VPNs. It's all done done through effectively multi protocol BGP address family type type scenario, right? So you're still using that single control plane. Yeah. Cool. Let's have a look. Yeah. So I think that's that's um, pretty much covered it. I will ch ch check uh, check out that uh, BFD timers thing. Actually, it's good uh, good point well made. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I was just looking at some of the the notes uh, in in the mm. background there, and yeah, I mean that's pretty cool that they've used they've um, they're using like BFD. It does say like BFD probes and all that in the notes of some of the official official stuff that I was looking at so no that's uh, yeah that's opened my eyes yeah, I, that we're using BF I, see it's, it's like you said before the, the guys who built this this stuff are used to work for Cisco right they, they they're familiar with with how things were done with Cisco what they've clearly done is looked at it and gone yeah we can do this better or mm. different or whatever and, and meet a, a different set of requirements, and they've gone away and, and done that. And Cisco have looked at it and gone, "Hey, that's very cool. We like that." And that's why they brought them back in. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the standard stuff in there, but it's the way they've pieced it together, which has has yeah. sort of you know sort of um, made people sit up and take notice of things. So yeah, that's no, good. Right. Okay. What? What? I'm just looking down the the list of things, and, and again, uh, time is always uh, always pressing. Um, the next thing um, I've got on the list was resilience and scale. So we've talked a little bit about some of that already. Um, what I'll do is we'll just dash through some of that quickly now. So um, from a resilience point of view, there's probably three um, three areas to look at there. Um, there's there's the site uh, the individual sites. There's the the transports, um, and then there's the the controllers. Um, from from a site perspective, obviously, to get a site to be resilient, you need um, a couple of things. One is is transports, and we'll come to that in a minute. But obviously, if you've got multiple V edges. 
um, that that will make your site um, resilient. Okay, so so we can just put um, we can just create a site um, with let's say two V edges, and, and I drew this before anyway. Um, excuse me, should have turned those off. Um, and then um, you can either uh, run VRRP um, and then just use the, a default gateway that moves between the V edges um, or um, if you've got another uh, another device there, you can run a routing protocol like OSPF. Um, so you've got VRRP and you've got, you've got OSPF. You've got um, BGP. Obviously, um, EIGRP. Who knows? It's not there yet. Um, obviously, the fact that you mentioned before they're embedding the Vitella code into the ISRs. Um, I don't think we'll ever see EIGRP in the um, in the, the Vitella CPE, just because. Um, I think you will find the IGLP um, in the ISRs. Y you could probably argue in the long term that the um, the Cisco um, ISRs will be the default CPE for this anyway. Um, it makes sense to have a single platform to go um, SD WAN or or just standard hybrid WAN. So, yeah. so I mean, if they want the EIGRP into like the IS, ISR or the NCS version of this, or the, whatever the image may be, uh, nobody will uh, nobody with EIGRP will ever deploy it because they're not going to no. change, you know, their LAN routing protocol just to go to a new uh, SD WAN. Well, they, you know, they might, they might but it depends on the deployment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think I think because if they go to any other um any other SD WAN vendor, they are not going to support EIGLP. Yeah, good so point. You could argue point. you could argue that if you're replacing your WAN, that you might make the make the effort to either A change it or B um to interface with it using a different routing program. But yeah, no, I take I take your point. I think I think like I say, in the grand scheme of things. I think the fact they're using ISRs, the fact they'll be promoting ISRs, I think you'll find that everything moves to EHRP anyway. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose it depends how the LAN side of the network fits together because, uh, you know, if it's a rooted link then they and they run EIGRP, they might just change that handover link to a BGP handover, for example. Uh, that, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's the beauty of it, isn't it? If you, you've you got that that capability to, to run uh, BGP. Of course, the other the other option now is ISIS, which um, who knows, you know, uh, ISIS is, is, you know, the, the underlay routing protocol of choice at the moment in, yeah. in the, the, the sort of campus fabrics and the DC fabrics. So maybe that that's another. Uh, another option there i don't know but um again i think if you're going down the isr path you've covered all the bases on that so i i suspect that's where it'll end up myself yeah. but um, yeah we'll see as so, ever uh, it depends it depends it depends always always right always so um you, you, obviously the other part to to, um, to to site resilience is the transports and basically where you, you can have multiple um, multiple transports they can either go um, uh, into a single v edge so we've uh, kind of covered this already really but um, you can have um, multiple uh, v edges in a site um, And then have the but you know multiple transports presented to multiple of the V edges, or you can do what we call T lock extension, which is the thing we just talked about before. I'll just draw those things out again, and I'll get rid of this one and do it over. There's a bit more space. Um, just slide that over there. Um, so yeah, so if we've got the um, the two transports our options are um, we do this 
and connect to the to the two transports um we can do this and sort of combine the um the cpe and the transport resilience or um to keep costs down essentially we do uh, that's always a bonus we do this all right i'm gonna plug this in now the only problem with this is it tends to get a bit flaky but we'll see how we get on um and that allows us, so that allows us to extend um ex basically extend the um the transports through to the other routers without having the additional access circuits in place it takes an interface on each one um but essentially it's um just tees off another another interface between the two okay so that's a um, that's called T lock extension. So, so where the the reason for that is obviously we talked about what T locks were before. What that means is you've got a T lock here um, on on the second router on the green uh, transport, and you've also got uh, a T lock here on the green transport, but it's teed through the the, the other router. Did did you see? Could the, I'll make sure if I can make that. Yeah, clear. I think like the question was so is that like a fit like. The, the green and the red between the two V edges, is that a physical interface that's required? Yeah, sorry. So the, so it's actually two physical, well, it's a, a physical interface per V lock, ex, uh, T lock extension. So you have to, um, you, you're literally teeing uh, an additional physical connection into the transport. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, you still, still using the physical interface um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the V edge. But you're just not have plugging it directly uh, the, those second ones into circuits. You're plugging them into the other router. And there's no way at this stage to make that like a single physical with multiple virtual. No, that's that's physical uh, physical interfaces. So you obviously have to count that into your uh, into your CPE um, cost to make yeah. sure that you've got the right the right kit. Ah, yeah, but that's your, that's basically in respect to your transports, isn't it? So it doesn't affect like the VRFs type uh, part of it or anything, does it? It's no. your transports. Yeah, that's, all good. Yeah, all that's, right. that's exactly it. So, so yeah, so so the the reason you do that is so that you've got that presence of the of the transport on on both the edges in in the network. Yeah. So all what that's actually doing is allowing you to make those policy based um routing decisions um based on um on whichever v edge that you've got obviously if that if one v edge only has one transport in it it can't make a decision based on the fact that there's a there's a um there's a green when it's only got a red so by using yeah, the team it, it does link to the it does link to the you know the fancy policy based routing as well because if it didn't you could probably you could achieve that just from a circuit resilience in the same way by putting a LAN switch in front and VLANing it off. But yeah. what we're really concentrated on here is being able to uh, enforce the policy uh, from either either of the two V edges. Yeah, exactly that. The route. Exa route. Exactly that. Exactly. Um, and and yeah, that that just makes it um, makes it cleaner. You just got to obviously watch for the yeah the trade off there is the. Uh, is the fact using the physical interfaces so e lock extension sounded a lot more complicated before you explained it so it's clear <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's the idea now i mean it is it's definitely the way to do it in in that yeah. scenario I mean, it's, and it saves saves the cost of the additional the additional transport so that's always good obviously in a in a data center environment or something along those lines you'd probably look to have multiple um yeah. multiple transports yeah. into the two um anyway because obviously if you lose one of those v edges you lose the transport that's associated with it yeah whereas you know in a in a data center or high availability environment you want to maintain um the two transports even if you lose one of the v edges so sure 
So um, the other the other element of uh, resilience and scale is the controller side of things. Now um, you'll have to bear with me a little bit because um, this uh, the fact that my my battery is low and I'm on the charge now. This sometimes gets a bit shaky, but let's see how we go. Um, so on the controller side, yeah, there we go. You see what I mean? Um, just gonna flip that out a sec. Um, yeah, okay, I know. Um, <laughs> there, you've got the V bond. Um, the vManage and the vSmart. Okay. Um, now, in in each of those, um, there's there's a different um, requirement for resilience and a different effect, if you like. With the vBond, um, the only thing that you're worried about on the resilience side of that one is that you've got one available. Um, and typically, what you'll do there is is have um you'll you'll have perhaps two so that if one fails you've got the other one available the only time you need it is at bring up so it's it's that point where a, a v edge registers into the network um so you you either you do one or two things you either have a a, a dns uh, round robin going between two and then if you lose one it just fails to the other um or um uh yeah well, that's probably the best way actually um essentially so long as you've got the two and there's a mechanism there to fail from one to the other you're all good um you you can add more whether it's it's needed or not um i suppose if you're bringing up um new v edges constantly all the time in a big network then you might choose to to need more capacity in the v-bond but other than that it's it's relatively uh, low key um, vmanage is um, a cluster based resilience so you have much as you have in apic in in um, aci um, if you can have a you either have one or you have three um, and those those three so that you get quorum um, on the on the databases um, the, the database is sharded between the three, and uh, and so you can always build the um, rebuild the database based on losing one of the boxes. Um, v manage is probably the least necessary in a sense from a resilience point of view, um, apart from the fact that you're doing your um, your certificate um, if you're doing your certificate authority stuff through v manage because. Um, until um, until it comes to certificate rollover, um, you don't actually need the, the comms between a V edge and a V manage for it to function. Um, v manage is there as the interface um, from a user, uh, the admin user to the environment. No more than that. So so long as so long as the boxes are up and running, so long as they've got a V smart available for, to them, they will um, they'll keep functioning. Um, and V manage is just you, you can't update the policy, you can't make changes to it, and you can't get the visibility because you can't see what's going on. But so other than that, similar, again, like ref, ref, referring uh, people who are familiar with Cisco and Meraki, it's like when the Meraki cloud is unavailable. So if your internet pipes go down uh, in your organisation, your Meraki network doesn't go down; it yeah. still continues to function. Fun, function. Uh, you just can't tell what's going on, or, or push config out, or uh, and this is this is a similar thing with everything. It's like uh, you know wireless LAN controllers running Flex Connect, for example. Yeah. You, or uh, you know you lose you lose uh, you lose your controllers, or you lose your radius servers. Whatever's connected to your wireless LAN at that time will continue to function, but you can't have new authentications. So it's, it's it's all the same similar kind of concepts as very similar yeah yeah very similar always been around but yeah it's good to good to understand that yeah and as and and I mean the last element there is the is the V smart we've already talked a little bit about that the 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 V edge can register with um, as many of uh, uh, oh, sorry it can register with three but you can have as many as you like V smart so um, the V um, v bond will present a series of, of uh, IP addresses to the V edge when it registers. It will then just join up with three three V smarts. If you lose one, then you've still got two. If you lose another one, then you you, you know you still got one. And so long as you're able to access it 
over one of your transports, you're good. So the, the, the vSmart is the bit that's that's key, but it's probably um, the most bulletproof as well, to be honest. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty solid. So. Gotcha. Um, and can, and obviously from a scaling point of view is the bit that where it, the bigger the network, the more vSmarts you need. Same as same as with a you know uh, again um, you know uh, thinking of root reflectors in in a uh, service provider network or whatever. Same thing. You scale it out by building building those out. Um, typically, as two as two as two typical or th or three. You said clusters. Three, uh, three, two, two, two V smarts typical then. Two, two or two or three. Two or um, yeah, I mean you, you don't have one, but, but yeah. for, for obvious reasons. But it just depends on the scale. Again, looking at the the numbers of of the sizes of environments we've looked at, we spec twos, we spec threes, um, and that's purely down to uh, usually um, geographic um, spread as well. Because you think yeah. about, you know, if you you want you want that that thing of being able to to have a bit of a geographic spread as well. Right. If there's, you if there's might a, have a couple a couple in your primary data center and one in your secondary kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's important to to think about about that sort of stuff. Now, again, if you're uh, you may look at it slightly differently if you're cloud using cloud connected um, um, controllers. So. But 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 it's the same the same kind of thought processes it has to go into it. So yeah, then you've got like if you're using cloud hosted or if you uh, you know if for example you put put them in AWS or some or Azure or whatever you've got a whole a whole other uh, can of worms to open like availability zones and yeah absolutely and all the rest of it. So yeah yeah um, and, and then and then it's like right okay what happens if uk west dies well then i need uk south or or you know it's that that kind of stuff isn't it that you need to be yeah. considered and and then it's like well what kind of connectivity have i got from there into the wider network and and so on so yeah all all of that um becomes becomes really important you, you need to start thinking then about how you uh, what your routing looks like and your uh, into your underlay so i mean this is something that that probably you know people sort of skip over a little bit but you've got the, these these um these monitoring uh, management platforms need to be visible to the underlay right mm -hmm. those services if you're going to use um a, your data center environment for your users they need to be on the overlay so so then you've got to think about well how much do i expose between my underlay and my overlay and um, where do I put that? That you know the controllers. If I put the controllers in my uh, my UCS and VMware platform in my data center, okay, I then have to expose elements of that to the underlay network and to the overlay network, depending on on where things are, and and it becomes a really really important part of the of the resilience and the the scaling um, question as to where those those things are and how you look after the routing between them. Um, I think it's it's a general problem with um, with that that whole kind of overlay network scenario. Anyway, been looking into doing software defined access, and again, you you have a very similar question there because all the um, the switches in in an SDA network need to be able to talk to to DNA center. Well, DNA center is the controller, right? Well, that controller. Um, has to also have a visibility of the overlay because because it needs to be able to see um, the uh, wireless LAN environments or whatever or users and, and so on and so you again how much of it you expose to the underlay and to the overlay becomes really important so uh, same with any of these things yeah that's pretty key so um, What's the next on the list? The next thing I've got Ooh. is automation and templates. And anything else you can think of at the moment, or? No, I think we'll just crack on to the automation and templates. Sure. So, so from an automation point of view, um, and again, I'll, I'll probably draw this one a bit like the last one. Um, I'm really co conscious my battery keeps uh, it's running low, but uh, let's see how we go. Um, from an automation point of view, come back now. Thank you. There we go. Um, 
we've got two um, two elements that we need to think about. One is the provisioning, and we've kind of talked through this already with uh, the zero touch stuff. Um, but I'll um, I'll dash through that again um, in a minute. Uh, and then there's the um, the templating of the actual configuration. Um, so we'll um, we'll discuss that one as well. So the provisioning was, was said already is is done using vbond um it's um in theory proper um ztp that basically what what happens is when those boxes come up the the dns name they're looking for is ztp.fitteller.com that's the one that gets then um that's the central cisco um vbond that then gets redirected to your corporate um, v bond um, and that's um, associated with the organization at order time so that's the thing where we where they, you give them um, the, the um, your v bond details and they'll and they do that redirect as part of that um, and in that scenario um, then you've got all the information uh, there about what um, which you which the edges are associated with your organization and um, as those um, devices come up into the network they connect to vbond and they sit there as unclaimed until you then um, push a, a template configuration to them um, or you can set it so that there's an automatic template that gets pushed to them when they join the network um, so that's a pretty straightforward process uh, well documented as far as the templating itself is concerned, there are two types of, um, of templates and the, and the way they build out is uh, quite interesting. What you have is you have a set of feature templates. So these are your sort of config building blocks, if you will. Um, and, and essentially what that'll be is things like, right, I'll have a bit of, I'll have some NTP, and I'll have some logging data, logging config, and DHCP relay, and things like that. That you um, piece all of the configurations together that will be uh, applied to all of the devices in the network. And then what you do is you create a set of uh, device templates. And these device templates are based a model specific. And what they do is um, you assemble those based on the feature templates. So you turn around and say, right, okay, this type of um, this type of, of V Edge will always have this standard um, routing config, or this standard uh, management config, but it might only um, use OSPF to talk to the local network because um, uh, because it's of a certain scale. Okay. You might have a different. You might have a different one that uses VRRP and um, with a, with static routing because it's a smaller um, a, a smaller install, and so you build out like a it's it, you mentioned it the other day um, essentially site type uh, like a site type matrix yeah of um, using different um, uh, different groups of features in a template configuration depending on what the site type was um, and so that's what you do you assemble you build out the, the, the individual feature uh, configurations and then you apply those in groups to groups of devices um, which uh, yeah what you and then what you you do as part of the provisioning process you can you can assign um, those device templates to um, groups of, of um, uh, serial numbers uh, so that when a, a device joins the network it goes through the, the ZTP and then um, pulls the, the associated template through and applies it. Then if you modify the template, if a configuration of an existing device is seen to be um, based on a template, if you modify the template that modification gets pushed to all the devices that use that template, um, rather than rather than it just be a apply the template and step back. That template is is 
live and part of the um, the operational configuration. So as you modify the template, it modifies the operational config across the board. Does it do any kind of check to make sure it's not going to break anything and revert it if it does? I mean, that, that's a you know fairly standard sort of approach. Um, obviously, the difference here is that you're not doing CLI. Um, you, while you do have the capability to do that, if um, if the um, vManage sees that you've got a device template applied to a to a router uh, to a vEdge, but that vEdge config has been changed, it will revert it. It will change it back. So it's centrally managed um, yeah. through the through the vManage. So in theory, uh, that helps with change control and reversion yeah. plans and all that kind of compliance thing. and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So uh, really useful feature, um, and certainly the way uh, the way these things should be, right? Yeah, it beats it beats uh, writing uh, a change control and then a reversion plan with no in front of all the the commands. <laughs> the, the, the CLI that you have to take them out in a certain order backwards. I was going to say just it all in the right order and and having to to swap the orders round and ah uh, oh, yeah no no. Um, yeah, I mean, there are times, aren't there, where you where you look at GUI and think, oh, really, do, do I want to do a GUI for this stuff? But sometimes it just works and is important to be done properly. So. Yeah, cool. Jobs are good on that then. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah. So um, I'm going to dash through the policy stuff because I'm really mindful of the uh, of the time here. I know it's it's funny when you were when you were doing the um, IWAM one. Um, and we're thinking then about the time and it felt like it was running and running and it's like well actually I can um, I can see um, how you end up in that situation so the yeah, uh, I mean, key thing here is like uh, no matter how high level you take these discussions uh, um, there's a lot to cover and trying to cram it into 40 minutes the only way or 40 or 60 minutes for some of the things um, to, to explain it properly um, you know it's not you're it's just impossible to fit so much information into such a small space of time and to do yeah. it justice. I um, think that's the point. Is is I'd rather do it justice and and make sure that we uh, we cover things properly. So yeah, no, it's, uh, so we'll crack on. Um, uh, just shout up if I if I'm going too quick, but uh, let's. Uh, it, we'll, we've yeah. just got these last couple of bits left. So so from a policy can, point, of view, people can slow it down on YouTube now these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, always. Or they can just contact us and ask us ask to go through it. things in, in more detail, right? So, yeah, more than happy to do that now. Yeah, let's, here we go. So, policy is all managed through vManage, okay, um, and applied um, over NetConf into the vSmarts and down to the vEdges that way. Um, the the vSmarts, as well as I don't, I don't know if I made that clear enough, but the vSmart isn't just about the routing um, in the network. It's about um, all of the control of the vEdges. So that's that's policy as well as um, routing. Important to, to make that clear. Um, there are two two forms of con of, uh, of policy that we we talk about, and I'll stop. To, is that? Oh, there we go. Um, Control uh, policy and data policy. Hey, up. There we go. Um, control plane and data plane. That's control plane and data plane, essentially. Yeah. Um, now, when when you're talking about the control plane, what you're talking about here is primarily is around how the um, the routing is. Um, defined and controlled and again um, for each of the different types of, of policy you've got a, a local definition and a, a central definition and my writing is starting to go pop because of the charge on on here but never mind <clears throat> um, the local definition is about the interfaces and the routing protocol you're running into the LAN and that sort of side of things. It's the it's how you interact with the with the, the sort of at the edges with the with the wider uh, elements of network. Okay, so um, yeah, that's that's um, whoa. 
forgive me. I'll uh, try and write quickly. So um, interfaces and yeah, the routing protocol. Um, the, the centralized stuff is all about the um, the big picture, about the overlay, um, and about how um, the uh, transport network is. Uh, the transport networks are used. What the the tunneling looks like in order to form up the overlay. So, so it's the VPNs, and it's around OMP really. Um, now. In OMP, you're carrying a number of different types of routes. You're carrying what are called V routes, which are the, um, the service networks, the, the LAN uh, subnets that are being carried around the network. You're carrying information about the T-locks themselves, so knowing which interfaces are connected on which devices to which, um, which subnets, uh, sorry, which transports. Um, and um, the oh no, I've got that the wrong way around. The service routes are the the LAN routes. Sorry, the V routes are the um, are the, the transport network. So this is the the loopback addresses, if you like, that are used on the V edges to form up the the um, the, the transport networks. Um, okay. So yeah, those those are the three sort of sets of routes that are, that are carried. Um, <laughs> Almost, you could almost argue that 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 all of that stuff is is the bread and butter, right? That's just how you make things work and how they uh, how it functions and how you form up that that overlay. Um, the the kind of more interesting stuff is is really in the data plane. Um, and again, you've got a local element to that and a, a central element. And on this side, what you've got here is things like um, the um, ACLs and the QAs and and those kind of elements um, that are deployed locally on on the V edge um, and centrally and here comes the here's the, the important bit the v, the VPN membership so where those VPNs are extended um, across the overlay but the the key one here is the application side right so the application definition um, and I'll and I'll just pop service chaining on the bottom here as well so what we're doing is um defining applicate uh policy the way that we want to route traffic across the network based on application so we talked about this in iwan right you you sort of covered um mbar and uh, and um avc and 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 the sort of mechanisms that we use to to, to do this this is the point where we do the same thing in Viptela. <coughs> so it's it's very similar in, in some senses. What it will do is use that data that we've pulled from BFD in terms of the, um, the paths through the network. Um, we can bring that together with the, the data of, um, that we, we're picking up um, from the applications itself in terms of yeah, I, could, I recognize that this is Office 365 or it's... That's where, um, the, whatever. That's where that VEX fits in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's the same same thing. So so the, the mechanism it's using to identify that traffic, it will send send off uh, the IP fix stuff out, <coughs> but it also, it's also using that same mechanism to be able to say, right, okay, for the, here, here are my list of applications, and this is what I'll do with those applications and the way that I'll, I'll route traffic, the way that I'll apply quas, and so on and so forth. So it's, so it's very same same concept basically to what what we've already seen uh, in Iwan, and and you'll see across across all other uh, other SD WAN environments, I guess. Um, it's all of that is managed through vManage. Um, the local stuff is all implemented on the VEdge platforms themselves. Um, the central elements are, uh, um, are looked after on the vSmart systems. So um, uh, managing the, the um, uh, application um, routing, managing this, the, um, the VPN membership and so on, all dealt with on the vSmarts. The one thing I didn't mention is, is, and I wrote it down there, is the service chaining. So you've got an additional capability here based on um, <coughs> the um on on either based on specific destinations 
or again on uh, based on on certain applications you can actually insert um, a, a hop in the path if you like to to a particular service in order to um, to bring that into the uh, into the traffic flow um, for example you could decide right okay here's um, some traffic going to a particular service on the internet I want it to go through an IPS or, or um, I want it to go through um, uh, data leakage protection or something like that and it will um, you, ins you can insert that service into the into the chain um, and push that traffic through that in order in order for it to uh, uh, to be scrubbed before it leaves the um, leaves the environment you, you get the picture yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's a it's a fairly yeah. service 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 is something that's being seen uh, across all SDN type platforms isn't it so it's like it's basically putting like a virtual appliance in between some two services kind of thing or in yeah. a service in in so as far wow. as this is concerned, as, as far as as Viptel is concerned, what it what it you can actually do is is actually physically route the traffic to a physical box that's that's completely unrelated to the um, to the service, um, present it to the box, let it do what it needs to do, and then take it back into the network and pass it on. So do that at an application yeah, level. Yeah, I mean it's routing. It's routing traffic based on on the application, but it's but it's inserting hops, if you like, into yeah. the network, into the path. So it's yeah. it's, it's quite, a, like, quite an interesting you capability. Draw, you could probably draw an analogy, like, but obviously it's nothing like this from a configuration perspective, but there's something like WCCP redirection. Yes. To, yes. Like, you, if you have like a uh, well, let's just take it like for one of the things that WCCP is typically used for. Um, if you've got like web traffic going via, it needs to go via a web proxy. It might hit your internet edge switch or your whatever uh, distribution layer switch, which will redirect it out to the web proxy, the back end, then out through your internet pipe. Yeah. But without all the WCCP <laughs> nonsense that you have to go through in order to achieve that at the CLI. And uh, yeah, so oh, that's that's pretty cool. And if you can no. do it, the other, the other thing is if you can do it at an application. When we say an application here, we're talking layer seven. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. so it's. I mean, the, the, there are a whole load of other features that we've we've not touched on, and probably maybe one for another time. But, um, <clears throat> for example, um, you can it can detect whether you're running Office three six five, and decide right, okay, rather than send it to a central internet breakout um, in the data center, okay. uh, break it out locally. And, and pass it out to to Office 365 that way, or vice versa. You can you can say right, okay, I can see this is a web application, but um, it's going to a location that I don't know, so I'm going to pass it internally and make sure it's scrubbed before it leaves, so that I can get you know make sure I'm not leaking any data or whatever, or I'm um, obfuscating personal information or or that sort of thing. So so you you've got a lot of control there around the sorts of things you might want to do and the things like the the, the cloud um, what they call is cloud on ramp where they uh, they select an exit path that's quickest to get to the cloud um, to cloud applications for example. Mm. You've, all of those are just extensions, really, of that service chaining and the uh, and the application routing. But it, they're all sort of all there. You can also um, you've also got a whole load of uh, integration into Cisco Umbrella from a security yeah. perspective. If you're doing a local breakout, you you need some security, right? So so it will do that and it will push it out via Umbrella or uh, whatever in order to make sure that that you're protected as you leave as well. Absolutely, and I mean that's the thing that I've experienced in being a, a kind of like a blocker, and uh, some of the things I've seen in real life that have that you know we all know the functionality. All this is here, uh, you know, to to do internet breakout based on application. However, it changes the whole security posture of your organisation if you start if you've always went through a central data centre, uh, and you've got like Checkpoint or Cisco or Fortinet firewalls, and you say right, well, how the I don't want to buy like a checkpoint or a Cisco or a Fortinet for every site. 
service chain and there's a way that you could potentially uh, put some sort of VM on an appliance, like a routing, an SD WAN appliance at the site, uh, and or uh, or if you wanted the physical side, that could do this service chain and um, and you can push the firewall policy for the organisation out to your sites, your SD WAN sites. So if you were breaking out to Office 365, it would be going through a firewall with exactly the same policy uh, as 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 resides within the data centre. Yeah, I mean, so so the in, in the VIP in the VIP Teller platform now there is um, there is actually stateful firewall and built into the into the V Edge, so yeah. um, you've got that, and of course that that being managed by V Manage means that you you're able to centrally control that policy anyway. So, but 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 you can then layer on top of that you can start to layer things like umbrella and whatever um, you know yeah. sitting out in the network again centrally controlled so you know they're, they're really sort of starting you can see the integration from from a cisco point of view of of um the the security technologies and everything being integrated with with the vip teller platform um the next thing that they're looking at is integrating um, the other way into um, dna center so um by the middle of next year uh, dna center um, will host vManage, so you'll be able to bring those two things together, um, and effectively you can form up a, then a single policy from both your LAN and your WAN at the same place, um, mm -hmm. and and start to do some of the application visibility and everything through DNA Center that you can yeah. do in the LAN across the WAN as well. So the, it's forming up into into a quite a, you know a solid um, ecosystem. I mean because that was it, that, that, that's always where any company is going to want to go is the one big one big fabric like data center through one through a LAN, but you know we'll need I guess we'll need to wait and see how that how that yeah I mean I, I I've got thoughts about that I I don't know if they'll ever form it into a single fabric as such but I think so long yeah. as the policy is applicable across all three so for yeah. example at the moment SDA uses um trust sec yeah so it's um so it's ice and it's security group tags and and what have you to 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 apply that sort of segmentation they call it micro segmentation don't they but, um policy um you can now carry that um uh, sgt um and and the policy wrapped around it that's configured in ice you can carry that into aci now so you can integrate the two, um, which allows you to, when you're forming up security groups, they actually appear as endpoint groups in ACI. And when you build an endpoint group in ACI, it forms a, a, an SGT in um, in a trust sec. And so but then you can, you're in a position where you can define a contract in one and it applies in the other. Um, and so you're able to, to, to have that one set of policy. Or really, what this is about then is about pulling the SD WAN into that as well, uh, and being able to define not only policies based on an application in terms of who can access it, but how they access it and the direction they access it from. It all yeah. becomes one thing, so it becomes a properly application-centric policy that applies across the whole the whole thing. So, so you can see where that's going. Um, and it's been been coming a while, but um, yeah, look, exciting times. We've actually got a customer who want to do the whole thing. They've already got ACI. We're looking at um, SDA with them at the moment. We're doing a proof of concept, and they're already looking at SD WAN as a potential as well, which uh, should be a yeah. fun little project to do. So yeah, we... lots of options to to look at in yeah. the future. Yeah. So, so I guess that quite neatly leads leads to the to the sort of end of this one, really, and looking at the cons the, dif the different considerations. Um, uh, whether, yeah, I'll 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 just write these out. Um, but really, um, there's there's um, no real detail here. It's more discussion. Um, the the first one I've got on my list here um, is the fact that. Um, and I'll just pull that a second. Is the fact that you have to have a mesh of tunnels uh, between all your CPE? 
um, that um, has its own problems. Um, th there's obviously, um, if you've got a lot of sites, that's a lot of tunnels between uh, between all the the, uh, the V edges, um, and over a lot of transport, um, it's you know you, you're very quickly going to get up to very large numbers of tunnels. Now, what you can do, there's, there's obviously limits in the platform. Um, certain uh, V edges will only run up to let's say uh, 250 tunnels. So you then have to think about well, how many that, that might only allow me access to 30 odd sites potentially if I've got um, a lot of different transports involved. So you then have to look at how you can build up a hierarchy, if you like, a, a, a regionalized network. Um, you can, using the control policy, you can um, group sites based on um, Based on you know physical location or whatever, and you so long as you carefully sort of understand your your site allocations, you can build up like a almost like a hub spoke of meshes if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So you you have a, a full mesh and another full mesh, and then you you bring those together into a, a couple of hub sites or something um, to allow that to 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 get the continuity. So you have to be careful with that. You know, the, the, those numbers are, are not as high as you'd hope they'd be. Um, so it's about regionalizing the topology and then using the control policy to um, to, to manage and control those. those um, and so you need to worry about your site IDs and things like that and, and the way they're grouped. So that's quite quite an important one. Yeah. Um, there's, um, there's CPE. Yeah, look at that. Um, there's the, the the CPE. You, you've obviously got two choices at the moment, two options um, in terms of the platform you choose. Um, you've got the original Viptela V edges, which they're continuing to develop, and there will be more of them coming along. Um, and you've got the Cisco um, ISRs and um, and the the IOS XE dash SD WAN. Um, the Obviously, Cisco want you to go eventually down the the ISR route because uh, of the integration, because of the migration capability of moving from from one to uh, one setup to another, and so on. But it ain't ready yet. Definitely not ready yet. There's there's um, all sorts of horror stories about performance and that sort of thing. They need to be concerned about. Um, if you're sort of thinking about um, we talked about EIGRP as being a thing, but if you're you're thinking about the fact that you've got an existing ISR 4K estate out there already, and you want to then migrate to an SD WAN provision, then you you probably do need to look into it and understand the capability and understand the limitations. Um, it's not a straight license addition to make it happen. It's a different code image that you have to install on the router. Uh, in order to to enable it, and there's no there's not feature parity between the two. So one of the things we we mentioned when we were looking into it before was that um, you can't, for example, go from a, an I1 to a to an SD1 on the same box um, using uh, and, and using the same image because yeah. um, the SD1 it's a, wrap it's a rip and replace regardless of which way you go. And this obviously it depends when you're watching this video because it's like the 20th of January 2009. So if you're if you're watching this in 2024, it's probably, it's probably uh, different. It, you know? but, yeah. yeah. So yeah. no, it's a good shout. But yeah, so definitely again, want to watch for that feature parity and the and the stability of the platform is is important. You can you can see that there'd be um, useful uh, migration possibilities there. If you've already got the box there and you don't need to buy a new one and so on, um, you know, there, there's that that would be useful. But uh, yeah, definitely something to to watch for. Um, if you've got the V edge, um, you you're in a in an interesting position because you can, in theory, add that onto the side of your existing router state um, and effectively run it over the top of your existing WAN. So that that migration becomes a slightly different thing. It's similar to to one of the scenarios we were looking at again with IWAN. Um, you, yeah, you, is, that, um, is that an option? Like, uh, 
a UCS blade and an ISR and run a V marriage uh, sorry, or a V uh, a V a, a, you know what I mean a V edge, a v edge on the yeah, edge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's you know what uh, I, I, that, I, obviously it's a lot of uh, UCS uh, what is it B series E series yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Nah, there's, there's, another, theory, there's another series. I can't remember what it was, but it's a module that goes into yeah, yeah. some ISRs. Yeah. In, in theory, I can't see any reason why you couldn't do it. Whether there's a performance um, limitation on that or not would would be the interesting or thing. It's not a it's, it, it might not be a validated design because I've looked at stuff like. <laughs> putting, uh, <laughs> like ice policy service nodes on those blades, and they and they basically weren't. They were they, they were potentially powerful and uh, enough. However, they weren't in the CBD. So if you phoned up TAC, then you might get some pushback, etc. I mean, in theory, it's like impossible as nothing. But no, you know, and and I suppose like, the point with and we are not saying that it's supported. So uh, just <laughs> yeah. an idea. No, I mean, it's, but you but you're right. It's it's doable in terms of um, if you want to try stuff or or do proof of concept or whatever. Absolutely. Um, you know, any any VMware uh, type type environment will, will allow you to do that, so that's all good. But yeah, I mean, those those are the things. Is, is you need to understand what what scenarios you're looking for for the migration, the integration, I guess, um, to make those happen. But CPE is an important part of that decision. Um, as is controller location. Um, it's a really it's a potentially tricky one, um, and and I, we haven't touched on this, but um, the way that natting is involved and, and can be involved with the connectivity between um, all the environments, um, it it can be it can cause problems. Um, if you think about it, if you've got um, an example of a, a network, might be uh, let me just uh, let me just see if I can draw this in it or wind you can for a second. I'm just going to draw this real quick. If you've got um, standard to to transport, and I'm just going to draw in our um, uh, let's say it's an AWS, and you've got your controllers up in here. Uh, like so. And you've got a V edge um, down here, which is connected to your private network and um, the internet. If this guy um, needs to talk um, out of that private network to AWS, if there's not a direct connection from that transport network up to AWS, then you have to go via the internet, um, which is completely feasible, right? So you go in effectively this way through a firewall then if you start adding more the edges in here they're essentially being natted behind the same um, the same firewall and possibly mm -hmm. the same IP address mm -hmm. on the outside here which can lead to all kinds of issues. And again, we, we can go into a bit more detail on this one um, another time maybe, but but um, when the vSmarts are then trying to talk back into yeah. here and trying to talk back to these guys, if the connections are established in the wrong direction, how can it ever have, um, how can it ever hit the right vSmart unless you've got a one-to-one -one port forward mapping rule configured on the firewall to always ensure that everything uh, goes that way so so there's a there's a real trick to the to the natting um uh, scenarios that, that can occur there and there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, on making sure that that works correctly when you're using cloud um, um cloud connected uh, control platform yeah, so that's quite. And that's a common thing to have, like a, for a lot of companies to have, like uh, transport to AWS over the internet. Because yeah. unless it's a big, a big company, uh, in my experience, or a service provider, or normally the, the like the profile of customers to get the direct connects, or 
However, that said, I know a lot of ISPs are now offering, uh, and managed service providers are offering like uh, multi-cloud breakout. So, you know, yeah. they might all, they might, if you take an MPLS network from them, they have like a, basically a, a one big fat pipe as a service that you can say, off that pipe, I'll take access to AWS and Azure. Uh, but don't yeah, bother. Yeah. Google, but they've got they've got Google on tap. So if you want to take some a service from Google, or Google Oracle, on, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, 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 we do understand. Oracle, to, to, you know that's your inter cloud connectivity point yeah. within your own network. So, uh, it's, but, it's but right I, I see pri- uh, 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 enterprise customers and small to medium enterprise customers. They dabble in AWS and Azure, yeah. so they set up a VPN over the internet. Yeah. Of course, and and that's where that pro- that becomes a problem. So yeah, no, it's important to, uh, to to sort of track that through and understand what you know what that's going to bring. This is why certainly from from the the um, options we've looked at so far, we've tended to do host uh, to privately hosted uh, controllers for that reason. Um, I know that, that that other people look the other way and and think about right. Well, how do we make that that work? by publicly hosting stuff and and uh, yeah it's a it's a it's a debate that one and like you say it's not a specific to to this platform either so yeah interesting one um the other things I've, I've just scribbled on there uh pki we've already mentioned a little um you know really really key to make sure that the pki is good and clean and controlled and understood um, because um, yeah, it can be catastrophic if you get a, uh, a certificate expiry and it can't um, or and it can't um, be um, renewed in time. Or if there's if you know if you lose um, lose trust in the network or whatever, then then you're in trouble because every single one of those tunnels um, can. Well, the problem is. Because everything doesn't expire all at the same time, you get gradual degradation as as tunnels gradually go down until you reach a point where everything disappears off the network. So, yeah, important to to get that straight. And then I've put ZTP on there as the last one, and we've already sort of thrashed that one to death a little. But uh, just just that that point that if you're doing ZTP, um, that you um, you have to be aware of the, of the fact you want to do it. You have to be aware of the fact that you need everything set up so that you can, at ordering time, you can communicate with Cisco and get all the, the integration with the Cisco um, zero touch stuff um, built out. So yeah, just a few things, but but those are uh, sort of ones that, that have cropped up and have been important to what, what we've seen so far. I'm sure everybody who've, who's uh, who's done this out in the big wide world has seen um, other other gotchas, and I'd be really interested to hear of uh, of other people actually who've done this. Um, I know a couple of people I was going to uh, get to do some uh, to have a review of this and do uh, give us some comments. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll be able to do that for us. But uh, yeah, just a few things to go on there. So. I've got a feeling that's it. I'm feeling we, we've we've run and run quite away there. Um, is that all you? Is that all you've got? Is that? I all thought, it was, I thought it was going to be a quick a quick one, a quick overview. But that was, nah, that, 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 was uh, that was brilliant um, for me anyway. Uh, I learned a lot from that. Not really not having a clue other than like some of the acronyms and the terms. Uh, of the SD WAN solution, so thanks very much for. It's a pleasure, mate. For going over that. No, I was just going to say. I mean, if uh, you know anyone who's watching, if you've got any comments or corrections or criticisms, you know where we are um, at Net, Net Freestyle on Twitter. Um, emails networkfreestylers at gmail dot com, or you can leave comments on the YouTube um, or on the blog. Um, well, we look forward to to hearing what you've got to say about it. Really, so. Uh, yeah, I've got nothing more. I'm done. I'm, I'm exhausted. Happy days. Thanks very much. And we'll be in right, touch with the Twitter, tw- the Twitter feed about what we're going to do next. But uh, we've got a few ideas. We might take some input from uh, the followers to see what, see what you want. But we've got a couple of ideas uh, and it won't be too too long till we get something else out. All right. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching, everybody.